Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 lawyers over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My mission is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, is doing during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple crises. The global pandemic, Brexit, and of course, the ongoing and accelerating collapsing of capitalism, the state, and the climate through this decade. To do this, I need people, people like you, dear listener. Most of all, I need people who are in Leeds or who are from Leeds to come on this show and be my guests. So please join me and help me with this mission whenever and however you can. Critically, I will need people like you, dear listener, as financial backers. Please consider supporting or donating to this project. You can do so with a £1 monthly donation via either Patreon or Ko-fi, or you could donate any one-off amount to Working Hours via either Ko-fi or through the LibrePay button on the About page of Western Studios' website. Thank you. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? So I don't think I necessarily had... I'm, well, I'm like kind of all well majority of young boys maybe like footballer kind of that that was my go-to something sports wise initially was kind of where I was at but I think as I kind of grew up and I started kind of getting towards the prior, end of primary school and then definitely into high school and I probably knew that wasn't a realistic aim mm. um I didn't have a a kind of industry that kind of I want to work in, but I just knew at some point I wanted to try and own a business, I think, is something that always sticks out for me. Mm-hmm. Again, I didn't didn't really excel that much in any subject at school, so I didn't have a specific niche. And the only thing that I sort of were naturally good at was troubleshooting and problem solving, mm-hmm. which tended to lend itself well to IT and that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. It was something I enjoyed as I got to do more and more of it in school and then kind of it ticked all the boxes really. It was a kind of growing industry, it would be more and more important in the future because mm-hmm. obviously computers and things like that were, were more and more needed mm-hmm. um, and it was something that kind of I felt I could excel at mm-hmm. to a certain extent so mm-hmm. it just kind of lined up and yeah that I kind of sort of not fell into it but my ambition was always to do something for myself at some point and the kind of just the ability to, to do something good and yeah, it kind of to... all flowed together rather than being directed it was kind of like oh well this and this and this you made those connections or all the yeah. connections kind of naturally made themselves yeah I think so yeah yeah and it was something that um like I say I just I, I seemed to enjoy and I knew there was a high ceiling so mm-hmm. I wasn't going to be limited by a specific job role or industry. So right. yeah, I just sort of carried on down that path. And then, yeah, I guess I sort of always had that sort of ambition to do my own thing. But initially I went from being a sixth form and working part-time in a local sort of IT company sort mm-hmm. of, while I was doing part-time studying. That then gave me, I guess, the kind of insight as to how the IT company would work and how mm-hmm. you would deal with clients and customers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then just grew into to, to it, basically, I think. And then probably 2008-ish, um, we kind of went through a bit of a change with the company I worked for, and I was able to to get a bit of a shareholding in, mm-hmm. in the new company we were setting up, mm-hmm. which obviously then led into ever as it is now with me being one of the two sort of directors here. Mm-hmm. You're listening to Series 3, Episode 44, and to my guest, Jamie Marshall. This is another Zoom interview, recorded on the 27th of October, 2022. Hello, loves. So, I know that some non loiner listeners have had difficulty with understanding told Yorkshire accent when it gets re-broad-like. This episode is by no means the broadest Leeds slash Yorkie accent we've had on working hours, and nor will it be, but I don't think I've commented on this aspect yet. I trust you, listener, and I trust you can develop an ear for us as you continue listening to the show. Obviously, you'll have a better chance of developing that ear when my recordings are both clear and clean, 
so apologies that the sound is a little muddy again on this one. There is also a fair bit of background noise on this and even a fire alarm going off during this interview. I've used a pretty raw audio file here, but it gives the clearest voice quality to my ear at least. I have made a bunch of these episodes now and I will be starting series four in February. Book your January recording slot now, Leeds. Seriously, I really need people and you should really hear yourself. But I'm still making these out of bog rolls and sticky back plastic for a handful of, I guess, slightly confused onlookers. So just bear with me, I guess. Better quality will come with bigger audiences and more funding. If you don't know what the hell we're saying in an episode, then share that episode around with everyone and ask, does anybody know what the hell these northern people are on about? Can't understand a bloody word they're saying, it's doing me head in. Or however you say that where you're from. Or pay me to do the transcription work. I want transcriptions on all of these. I'm going to add transcriptions to the donation goals because I think it's a really important part of this process, but it's well laborious. So screw doing that work for free. It's not fun. I don't love my show that much. Plus, I have a lot of ground to cover and I really need to crack on whenever and wherever I can. I want to have the transcripts, but no. Like, transcribing 75 episodes of about two hours on average. No, not happening. I want paying for that time. Time-wise, it's basically an hour to do 15 minutes of transcription. Yeah, so if you want me to do a transcript on an episode, give me 200 quid, basically. I'm also going to get some publicity goals up to try and raise funding for some paid offline advertising that will be on either Patreon or Ko-fi or both. Because I want and I need to build my base audience in Leeds and to do that I also need offline people to be curious about this show and to want to listen to it and I want and need people with smartphones who don't currently listen to podcasts to start listening to them because of my podcast. It's good for my business, see? It's a great low impact art form, you don't have to travel anywhere, I don't have to use loads of materials, it's beautifully simple. Curation is still a big part of this project for me. I value all of these interviews, even the ones that get away from the show. This isn't disposable content, it's valuable data. If and when the power goes out for good, or when the internet is made available only to people on 50k or above, or when I'm made homeless and subsequently die of exposure and malnutrition, I want there to be something left of this project still if possible. Anyway, on with the show. Jamie Marshall started working in IT part-time while completing his A-levels in ICT, Business Studies and Art, dropping out of art at the end of the first year. After finishing his A-levels, he went on to a full-time role at the company and is now a director there. The company he initially started with part-time was based in Roundey and did both B2C, that's business to consumer if you didn't know, and B2B, business to business, IT services. In 2008, it split into two separate B2C and B2B companies. The new company handling B2B services was Everon. Jamie originally had a small shareholding in the new business. Over time, Everon grew and eventually Jamie became an equal shareholder with two other partners. In August 2017, Jamie and the other current shareholder, Stuart Crane, went through a management buyout of the third shareholder. Moving into city centre office space, it became the Everon of today. Everon now focuses on providing IT services to regulated industries, specifically with the aim of keeping clients secure and driving efficiencies using technology. Everon has been growing steadily over the last five years and has recently hired their first manager to help with continued growth. Over the next few years, Everon are hoping to double in size while retaining the company's current ethos and values at their heart. Everon also have ambitions to become a certified B Corporation and give back more to their local community. To find out more about Everon, go to everon.co.uk. Anyway, let's crack on with this episode of Working Hours with Jamie Marshall. Okay, so my normal next question would be sort of how did you get into it? But we kind of covered a bit of that. So I want to kind of go back to a couple of things that you said through that bit. Um, so... I thought it was interesting that you kind of identified a skill set of problem solving early on and also kind of wanting to go into business early on. So what do you think, like, how did you identify that as something that you were good at problem solving? Was it like you were always interested in puzzles and IT was like, it was always games. Like what were the, what were the kind of things that put that in your mind? And then also what was the inspiration for kind of going into business for yourself? Like, is that, 
family members that are in business for themselves or is it someone that you were like oh I really like such and such business person and you want to be there no so I mean to answer the second part first Mm. I think um I couldn't honestly tell you why I just feel like I had this that was always what I wanted to do and like no one else really in my family is kind of uh, I don't think as business orientated as me Uh, my dad's a driving instructor so he's self-employed but Mm. He he's happy kind of just doing his nine to five hours. There's no kind of ambition to go any further. And mm. um, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't I couldn't honestly say. I just I always remember it being something where I, I guess maybe when I was younger it was around material things. So mm. I remember I always telling my mum and dad, mm. I'm gonna have a Ferrari by 10 to 30, mm. which obviously I haven't done. But I just remember for me that was like a a goal and the way mm. to achieve that was to, to own a business mm. um <laughs> still obviously on the bucket list mm. to do <laughs> I'm, I'm not that close to it but I think that was the thing that triggered if I want these nice things then I'm mm. gonna have to go out and do it to get them mm-hmm. but uh, other than that I've kind of grown as I've got older or as I've especially in the, the kind of probably last 10 years with things like podcasts and YouTubes mm being able to actually listen and learn from people out there that are kind of doing either what I want to mm. do or even public figures like mm. the Elon Musk of this world kind of the people like that which when I was younger I never had access to any of that kind of stuff mm. um so it's only probably more in the last 10 years that I've understood a little bit more about what goes into things and I can take I can like podcasts that I listen to a lot of there's a lot of different ones that I listen to you can take bits from what people do or you can relate to some of the stuff they do because it's something that I'm trying to do now. Mm. Um, but that's more recent than than obviously when I kind of first set my goal on doing that. Mm. Um, and in terms of the, the problem solving thing, I um, I think it's just the way my, my brain works. I mm. seem to be like quite a logical thinker. Mm. So Are you like neurodivergent in any way? Are you like, has have you been tested for anything or? No, no. no. Um, I have just... you ever suspected anything in yourself because like I heard this I'm dyslexic myself and like one of the uh, it was at a conference somewhere and they said that uh, dyslexics are majority in two groups criminals and millionaires <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> I did it's funny because I was at a conference recently and this subject came up mm. and they talked about um, it being advantage to have been a entrepreneur mm-hmm. if the way the dyslexic mind works because you mm-hmm. had a more 360 view of everything and you weren't so tied into one thing or another mm-hmm. but um I can't say I ever have um mm-hmm. and I I just I'm not not uh, academic I learn through doing things which mm-hmm. I think again is probably a trait of like being able to physically touch something and problem solve and things mm-hmm. like that and do something in person I guess it is more logical for troubleshooting and IT problems than like I don't know learning something in a book like I'm not someone that can read a kind of course material and then go out and pass an exam on it like mm-hmm. I'll never be able to do that and I think I realized that quite early on mm. um and especially in stuff that I like doing I, my dad was a mechanic before I was a driving instructor mm-hmm. so I used to help him when he was doing mm-hmm. different bits like on sort of family cars and again being able to do something start to finish and physically do something and actually see the process I think mm-hmm fitted with the way I learn and the way I can take information on board so I don't know whether those sort of things all contributed to me then realizing this is what I want to be able to do and this is how I need to learn it I think out of all the subjects at school the way I learn and things like English math science just reading from a book but not being able to physically do something mm. I'd, I'd struggled like none of my academic grades were, were great I don't think mm. um even in IT where the exam and the, the kind of the A level in IT wasn't as practical as hands-on as maybe I would have liked mm. it was something I got a dean I think mm. yeah I run a, an IT business so mm. um yeah I just think I'd learned through doing and it kind of that's all troubleshooting for me. It's just being able to logically see something in my head and follow that process through, which mm. is exactly what we do in, in IT and in the problems and the troubleshooting and the way we attack problems and mm. issues is that exact process for me. So mm. yeah, I think that's probably more how it lined up or aligned with how I work and yeah. how I learn. Sort of more mechanically minded, like come on, like let's not sit around talk about this. Let's get in there and see what's broken and like take it apart, put it back together and 
Yeah, yeah, I, I'm always, uh, I was telling them, um, I had a golf lesson this week, it was one of the first golf lessons I had, and this system that could track, like, you swing, all these different metrics, to me, it was fascinating, fascinating, not just learning about, obviously, how to play golf, but mm. actually how the system worked, like, mm. I couldn't believe the amount of data this system could generate, and it was like, I was asking questions like, you know, is, is this a special club, with these special balls, but it, it was just, the system was that smart, and I think, yeah, being inquisitive into that sort of stuff again lends itself to IT and learning and mm. wanting to know kind of the how, not just the, the why. Mm. Yeah, what's going on under the hood? What what's happening in the background? Yeah, how, how does it all fit together? Like, mm. which bit does this? How does that work? So, yeah, again, with IT, I guess it's a bit of a marmite subject mm. for people. People either love it or people hate it, and mm. the people that hate it just want it to work, and they don't care about how it works or why it works. They just want it to work yeah whereas i think i'm in the other camp where it's genuinely interesting and i like to understand how it works and mm. it makes it easy to, to problem solve them when you kind of see all the different components and yeah know how they fit together mm. okay so one last question on this area before we move on so i just want to like explore how you got into that first role uh part-time at the it place with that like how how did that come about because I mean that's not a paper round or like I mean you, you were fairly young so yeah how did how did that happen uh so I mean I always had so I had paper rounds like the usual kind of stuff everybody <laughs> does and then um I think I must have been 14 ish maybe um mm. I actually worked at a local bakery initially doing some like cleaning bits but then moved into kind of doing a little uh, helping with the baking or a little like bit part-time with, uh, Saturday sort of thing yeah sort yeah. of Saturday and then a couple nights after week it was mm. It, I think, was nearly 24 hours a day, this kind of bakery, mm -hmm. um, for six days a week because um, mm -hmm. they did a lot of corporate stuff. So I could go in after school. So I think I was already used to a little bit the world of work. Mm -hmm. And then when I was doing my A-levels, obviously my mum was aware, kind of where I wanted to go, and I definitely knew that was the route I was taking at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I didn't want to go to university either. So I did A-levels to keep my options open but because I knew that wasn't going to be my next step. I was looking for work and the company I eventually went to work for did the IT support for my mum's office. And I think <laughs> she'd said in passing a couple of times to one of the guys that, that would that come to her office, mm. you know, my son's looking for something. Is there anything you guys have gotten? Mm -hmm. They put me in touch with the guy who owned the company. And then I um, I went in and sort of just had a chat with him here and there. And then so I think just started Saturdays with a few sample shifts mm -hmm. and then sort of grew into doing Saturdays, Tuesday, Thursdays, mm. and then as my studies were like finishing, just jumped into full time, mm. basically. There, so it was, uh, I guess, an element of luck and right place, right time. With mm. well, my mom working for that, well, working for the company that did, did yeah. But that, I support. mean, that's that's fortuitous events. But ultimately, when you got in there, you must have impressed enough, you know, like as a as a fourteen year old to not come across like badly or whatever you know so do you remember that first meeting quite well uh, yeah again it's funny because we've we've been hiring a few people recently mm. and I've never really had a proper interview so it was really mm. relaxed when I went in there mm -hmm. um I just remember kind of having a real chat everything being quite vague um mm. the guy we worked for um didn't have a proper procedure to not have the interviews it wasn't formal so I remember it being really casual and then kind of just yeah let's see how it goes and mm. obviously now when I interview people I think this is nuts that I'm interviewing people yeah I've never been for an interview process mm. myself mm. um which is 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 pretty weird but um yeah it was really relaxed I think with it being a kind of starting job and probably at my age um it was just let's see how it goes kind of thing you, you kind of learn on the job mm. and the the other kind of guys that were Saturdays or similar after me were a little bit older maybe two three years older but it was quite a young Mm -hmm. group so uh, they were quite accommodating and I could easily relate to them to learn and stuff so mm. yeah it was a good fit mm. and then of course like because you're a few in university and you've gone into work and you've gone into work early like you know I mean to you and your peers at that sort of at that sort of time you know they're all racking up debt and you're you're breaking it in hopefully <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean um, I don't think I ever really missed out on going to university. Mm. Um, obviously, I was earning money while, like you say, my kind of friends and stuff were at uni. So we'd go over and we'd spend time or go out and kind of nights out and stuff with them occasionally. But um, 
yeah, I don't think I missed the uni lifestyle. I've got friends that, well, to be honest, a lot of friends that I have went and did university courses and now mm. work in a completely different field to what they did the degrees in, mm. which to me sounds mm. insane, but mm. um, I think it's quite common now. Oh, yeah, yeah, think. very common, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, it, it's done me a good stead because I think it probably pushed me four or five years further ahead than somebody who'd gone out of uni and then would have had to start doing what I was doing. I was already sort of mm. past that level with the kind of on-the-job experience I'd had. We've kind of done a bit of how you got into it, but let's do the actual story then. So, like, tell us how your move through everyone and basically, because uh, I know from the information that you've already given me that, that you, you you kind of moved into it through a management buyout. So kind of talk us through that journey, what happened, and then, like, where they were then and where you are now. Yeah, so essentially the company I went to from Sixth Form um we worked for uh, his name was Jim so we worked with Jim as we grew a bit older so this is sort of 2007 2008 um there's myself and they were co-director now um we're kind of doing a lot more of the the b2b side of business um and growing to a point where we were starting to get more options or like I say I had ideas of running my own business at some point so it got to the point where we kind of split the the current company we work for Mm -hmm. And myself and Stuart, as either co-director here, took a part ownership in Everon. We're mm -hmm. um, still with the original boss that we had, and we had the two companies running side by side. Um, and from there, really, we we sort of grew into it as we were getting a bit older. We understood more about business and the way mm -hmm. things were working. Um, we kind of had a common goal about where we needed to take Everon and, and where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, the other director we had, they were sort of our original boss, um, was sort of towards the end of his working life and mm -hmm. didn't necessarily have the same goals that we had and kind of was after a different life, I think. And then as we were we kind of getting more and more focused on this goal and this mm -hmm. path that we wanted to take it, it became clear there was a, a difference in opinion and difference in kind of desires of what we both wanted out of this. Mm -hmm. um, so we had to have some difficult conversations initially. Um, and then we kind of settled on buying out our original boss from Evron. We dropped all of our sort of B2C related services. So we kind of didn't have like a storefront or anywhere where people could come in off the mm -hmm. street anymore. Uh, we moved into an office in Leeds, the center, and we went all in on B2B. Mm -hmm. um, from there, we kind of, as we've continued to learn, and this is kind of where it links back into being able to access these people on YouTube or podcasts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We've learned more about how we should niche down and we should target a specific vertical or niche mm -hmm. rather than just being everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at the client base that we have, we already had a lot of legal firms and regulated industries. Mm -hmm. So we took the decision to to target regulated industries, basically. So mm -hmm. with B2B, we, um, we just focus on Microsoft and Microsoft 365. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not trying to do kind of jack of all trades kind of thing mm. um regulated industries we know well because we have a good strong client base that already work within regulated industries so we mm. understand the data governance or the kind of governing bodies regulations for these different people mm -hmm. um and then luckily regulated industry is forced into change quicker than mm. any other industry because of those governing bodies so again it works well with our business model of wanting to be delivering kind of stuff at the forefront of technology it fits in well with these companies that have to adopt change quickly so yeah. um yeah it's kind of not necessarily something we planned right at the beginning mm. but as we've learned more and more about what would be more beneficial for us it's kind of again all aligned as to being well regulated industry is going to work really well for you guys and mm. we already had a big foot in the door there so mm. we kind of just really niched down and, and gone from there um when we went through management by probably, I can never remember, 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it took a bit of time. We had to have the conversation, get the business valued, mm -hmm. agree the kind of sales, and all that sort of stuff took probably 18 Raised months, maybe. Yeah. Um, luckily, we we were on good terms when we mm -hmm. parted. So we paid some money up front. We paid some money over the course of 12 months. So it, it worked out well from that perspective as well. But yeah, since then, we, at the sort of buyout time, we were three, four staff. We're getting on for 10 now. Mm. Um, and we've seen year on year growth, basically. And 
we're um we're hoping to double in size within the next two to three years again. Mm-hmm. So I think we've spent a lot of time doing things that um would set us in good standing for future growth. So we probably spent more time than we needed to looking at process and structure now, knowing that we could double in size and the platform we got still works rather than kind of taking on all these new clients, growing and then scrambling to make everything fit. Um, yeah. we, we've we've done it the other way around, I think, which um, is probably slower for us in the long run, but should be mm. more sustainable, hopefully. Mm. So I suppose initially, um, I mean, you, you're from Leeds yourself, aren't you? Yes, born and bred. So, I mean, that's kind of fortunate that you have what you have in the city in terms of the universities, in terms of training people in the IT skills. Like, has it been quite easy to find people? I mean, you've not done that much recruiting yet, but are you getting a lot of applications? Is it quite easy or does it make it um, even easier because you can do remote and flex and be flexible? Like, Yeah, I think um, in terms of then... The city we're in, we're really lucky because I think you've got Manchester's a big tech hub, mm. Leeds is pretty big, and then obviously you've got London where mm. I think they do everything. Um, so it's fortunate that we're in one of the kind of three tech hubs, um, which works well. And it's Manchester's literally what 40 minutes, 45 minutes on a train. So again, it's, it's pretty close. We, we, we're lucky in that respect. In terms of staffing, we've struggled to be if, if i'm honest people have, have been the hardest part of everything that we've done mm. um which is not something if you'd have asked me 10 years ago in 2008 or whenever we went through kind of the different stages what would be the biggest problem mm. i'd have never identified people and and recruiting as being the biggest problem mm-hmm. personally i think it's because that everybody wants to grow up doing tech-based or digital jobs nowadays mm-hmm. i think there's a lot of competition for staff um obviously if you to look back 30 40 years ago people would grow up and get a trade under the belt and mm-hmm. you'd have maybe a few people that did certain bits whereas now i think um everybody wants to do something within a tech or digital business probably more than than other industries um and then i also think because it's quite a a wide area we only do a little bit of it and we niche down into what we offer mm-hmm. that it's hard to find someone who wants to do exactly what we do. It's not that glamorous mm. compared to some of the other stuff. If you look at digital marketing and creative agencies, mm. like they have this whole persona of uh, being a really fun, like awesome social place to work. So people I think naturally are attracted to those. Mm. Not a lot of people are probably attracted to Microsoft 365 and mm. email servers and Microsoft Azure and all this other sort of stuff. And mm. um, so I think that that's made it hard. And then the fact that I think we approach it from a slightly different angle mm-hmm. uh, as to most IT companies. Mm-hmm. I think most IP, IT people care about metrics that the customer doesn't care about. Mm. So I think like like time recorded, for example, is a massive one within our industry. So out of a 37 and a half hour week or an eight hour day with a half an hour lunch, there's some IT companies I know that want people to be recorded seven and a half hours of worth of time mm. um all the one that answer as many calls as they can but mm. these metrics one they can be gamed and two they're internally beneficial for the company it's proven they're getting utilization out of that employee mm-hmm. it doesn't show any of the satisfaction or the kind of deliverables for the client mm. so we try and approach it from the opposite example and we want to work more on output than input mm-hmm. so our csat ratings like kind of the meaningful metrics that match the client is where we want to be delivering um, rather than those sort of inputs initially. Um, yeah, so we, um, I think we struggle when we get people from other IT companies because mm-hmm. they're so used to these other metrics that don't mean as much to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's sometimes a hard, people don't necessarily like change, do they? So it's sometimes a hard thing to get people to buy into changing to mm-hmm. To kind of seeing things the way we see i think kind of all those factors limit like sorry combined plus the fact that employment's never been at its lowest in the last year mm. have kind of really made it hard for us to, to find the right people mm. what scope do you have for kind of developing your own people like have you looked at apprenticeships or kickstarter or anything like that and maybe bringing yeah. someone in young and kind of training them up is that feasible for you or is it 
that's where we've had the success to be honest yeah. so um uh, friendships um uh, specifically have delivered um the last few people we've got um we've got two people just at the minute so one's just about to finish his apprenticeship one's just mm-hmm. started in the last sort of, two months and we've had a few before that and we do find that easier because people can we can take somebody and they can grow knowing what the everyone way is rather mm-hmm. than what kind of other IT companies do and then trying to fit in with our system so mm-hmm. I think that's definitely worthwhile um and we'll do more and more of that the only downside is if we're looking at growing you've got a year probably of somebody to do the apprenticeship I think it needs to be 13 months before we can technically complete it and mm-hmm. you've got a longer leading period so if we were to take somebody from another IT company mm-hmm. we put a window of probably three months on it until they were in and working up to speed the everyone way mm-hmm. an apprenticeship person might be 13 15 months mm-hmm. which um we get a better end result but if we need to speed up the cycle because we're growing faster you can't reactively go back and put those people in so Mm -hmm. something we do and we're going to do more of um we're also looking at graduate schemes um, Mm -hmm. which we've not done in the past to to work with some of the universities in Leeds Mm -hmm. to help get people either in like year outs or sponsor people or to kind of grow the workforce that way as well but we've then also had to go out and get people as we've needed them as well Mm -hmm. I don't know there's something there kind of like something there a bit more that I want to explore in kind of talent pool wise like and I'm thinking about sort of you know because tech's like a well IT let's say IT you know IT is a very mature industry now it's a mature market obviously there's a lot of development because you get these tech platforms that are doing various different things with IT and mean and you started your career working with people who you know obviously had been in the game a while and like so you yeah. have a good sense of the history of this kind of industry and market I I I, I want to get your thoughts on that kind of thing like you know is I mean is it that the people who are experienced and I mean you kind of said that it's the different way of thinking as well I mean we have had to, we have had people that we've hired from other companies that have come in and been able to fit in and done really well I'm not saying that people we can't do it that yeah, way yeah, yeah. um I just think that our industry is pretty stuck in these set metrics and the way mm. the problem we have as tech people is where we're not that sociable like we we're quite there and analytical mm. so when it when it comes to us picking things that we think matter sometimes they're not always um, complementary of customer service Mm-hmm. that's say so we pick metrics that we think are really important and we mm-hmm. love the data a bit like me saying I love to know how things work mm-hmm. we pick all these things that we think are really meaningful mm-hmm. but from the outside to a non-technical person that client who's supporting they're mm-hmm. actually not mm-hmm. like relatable at all mm-hmm. so I think that's the, the problem with that kind of stuff um in terms of like development and things like that I think there's enough out there that if somebody's got the right attitude and um, they've got a good aptitude for like whatever role it is you're hiring, mm. there's enough learning material out there now. There's enough, uh, hopefully, resource that people can learn and grow and sort of move down these different paths. Mm-hmm. In terms of our industry, it's forever moving. Mm-hmm. What I learned back 10, 15 years ago is like mm-hmm. utterly useless now. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure what people are learning now in 20 years again, will be kind of useless. So mm. you need to be continually improving and learning and developing. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you get left behind. Mm. Um, we internally do uh, personal development plans for whether people are apprentices or they come join us later mm. on. Everybody, so we have a company set of goals and objectives. Mm-hmm. Um, we give people their kind of free reign to pick their own path as long as they are complementary to the company goals and objectives. Mm. So if we're going down a particular route and we want to learn specific industry or we want to learn um for example like microsoft dynamics is something we, we're getting into at the moment mm. if one of the team takes an interest in learning dynamics and wants to really specialize in that mm. we give them learning time during their working week we pay for any of the assessments and mm. learning materials and courses as long as they link with company goals or they're, they run alongside our kind of mm. objectives we'll fully support people in doing that and our kind of vision is we'll always have these paths that people can take within IT because mm-hmm. it is quite a big area and you can, you can specialize in certain elements. Mm-hmm. 
and we don't ever want to limit somebody that works for us. There's no point losing somebody who's really good because they can go out and do bigger and better things. So that doesn't make sense for them or ours. So we'll always try and find a role or create a role that will work as long as it's something as a business we can make use of. And then our idea is we'll use graduates and apprentices to kind of keep filling the bottom of the team. Mm-hmm. And then as they they learn and get more exposure to the sort of things we can do or where we want to go, again, they can kind of pick their own paths and join the, the teams higher up as they learn and develop. Mm-hmm. And I think any company now that doesn't do any sort of personal development, definitely within tech, but I'd say within most industries, I think younger generations definitely want to learn more. I think it, salary and financial reward go so far, but I think people want more than that nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think development and the like career progression is definitely something you've got to offer as a company regardless of what industry you're in um, to sort of to keep these people and generate a culture where you're not going to have like, staff turnover and things like that. Mm. Right. So we'll we'll get into a bit of practice now then. So uh, I'm going to kick us off with COVID. So I want here, I want you to kind of think back to going into lockdown, uh, where you were, what happened, like if your work increased, decreased, you know, did it drop off? Did it just go through the roof? Uh, did it, pretty much stay the same like what impacts did it have and how has it changed your work sort of now like you know in the long term did it did it have a major effect on how you work and the way that you're working um so in terms of overall um it's probably been a positive for our industry as a whole Mm -hmm. um a few reasons for that are it's I did see a few stats on this, actually. It talked about the drivers of change within client organisations. Mm. So as in, like, budget being won, like, the leadership not planning and stuff. Um, and out of all the factors, COVID was the biggest driver of change because it was literally forced upon people. There was no choice. You literally, for example, like remote working, you might have had these kind of traditional companies that didn't see a value in it, didn't have the technology to make it work. Mm-hmm. And virtually overnight, they're forced into adopting it. And I think... Mm that changed a lot of people's opinions. And I think people that were quite traditional in their approach might have softened. And now, even though they might come back to the office or not be fully remote, I think they see a value in it now that they didn't see before. Mm. So I think overall, in terms of our company and the IT industry, it, it's not damaged us. In the short term, as in uh, what actually happened and the kind of steps we had to take were quite drastic. So. Um, I remember the Monday night or the Monday afternoon and the kind of statement going out mm-hmm. as this was going to happen. I remember we, um, me and Stuart, which is the director here, we probably here till about nine, 10 o'clock, crafting mm-hmm. emails to clients because it was literally such a kind of shock. It was kind of obviously something was happening and it was mm-hmm. moving forward, but for it to literally be an overnight change of mm-hmm. if you can work from home, work from home kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, then not only for our business, which we were already pretty well set up for remote working, mm. but for every client that we managed mm. would have to adopt it overnight. And we probably had, I think, maybe if our workload probably went up three, four times within mm. the first two weeks because literally everybody just took their devices home and then you've got the next two, three mornings, everyone <laughs> ringing up, how does this work? How gets that? And some... Some of the, the clients we have that were more cloud-based or adopted more cloud was had less um, disruption than others. Mm. Some that were more traditional or had, for example, like an on-site server that had mm-hmm. specific software that needed an on-site server. Mm-hmm. We had to put in kind of new solutions. Um, but kind of the way we approached it was we, we gave everybody this solution. We developed something. Mm. One of the remote tools that we use for kind of remote support we kind of redeveloped that so that we could deploy it for clients so they mm-hmm. could get into their office systems. Um, we gave everybody that for free. So we sort of, we took up all the licensing costs to, to try and help people out. Mm-hmm. Um, we then also had, I think, a few conversations with people once we'd got over that initial kind of hump of everybody moving all at once mm-hmm. um, around kind of where clients were furloughing people because that was quite a new thing that happened straight after mm. as in what would be needed from a licensing and perspective like for support yeah. and stuff yeah. obviously that user no longer needs support our staff member yeah but we need but to keep the backups back. live yeah. yeah yeah so um we kind of then developed furlough sort of 
plans mm-hmm. where they were just cut back to the bare minimum to keep the kind of devices secure, to keep the like mailboxes or the files online and mm-hmm. keep all the backups in. Mm-hmm. But then we took all the support elements out and all the other stuff. So in the short term now, we obviously had a dip in revenue coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, cost, we started to pay all the licensing costs, we started to pay all the staff costs. So we kind of had a few months where we were definitely less profitable, let's say. Mm. But at the same time, we like to be personable. We like to mm. to have strong relationships with the clients. So like mm. one of our values is is exactly that to, mm. to value relationships and to understand clients' businesses. So where we knew clients would struggle, it was better for us to offer a lead in hand if we could mm. than to have that client go bust. Yeah, and yeah. then it'd be a lose lose for both of us. So. Yeah. We have a few, like, for example, like some of the medical clients we had had mm-hmm. actual clinics that physically shut down. They mm-hmm. couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. So we had to do more for those kind of people versus maybe the solicitor who could mm-hmm. still work but could work remotely. So we kind of just tried to do what we could where we could. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it was a forever changing thing, I think. It was probably different for every business you've got to. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of had this weird period um towards the sort of middle or end of the first lockdown where everybody that was shutting down and shut down would do kind of resolve what we could everybody that was uh, remote working had been set up and were remote working mm. everybody that was going to be furloughed was furloughed and then we sort of just had this this period where it had the help desk so the actual kind of incoming tickets and issues we get just dropped off a cliff where mm. people were working and just it was working but there was no change happening it was like they were just repeating the, the day over and over um there was no project work happening obviously so again mm. we, we just had all this extra time and it was good in a way because we were always doing lots and trying to do lots and there's always more we can do mm. but we never always get to it so we've got a long to-do list mm. as in myself and Stuart as well things we want to implement things we want to do in it it basically gave us like a couple of months where we could really knuckle down, mm. not be involved in all of the day-to-day tickets and stuff like that, but literally mm. focus on the business where we're going, what we're doing, and mm. the things we wanted to implement. So mm-hmm. I, it probably sounds unnatural to say, but I kind of really enjoyed that period because um, we didn't have those day-to-day elements we were stuck kind of trying to firefight with, mm. and we could actually just finally just concentrate on this to-do list. And mm. I think we actually sped up kind of the cycle of what we were doing, what we were implementing quite a bit in that period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then obviously it ended, people went back to work. It was kind of the mixed approach. So it sort of steadily built back up then as companies were either going back mm. into the office or not. And then, yeah, I think we just tried to, to be as flexible as we can. Here, I want to kind of look at your work-life balance and sort of say, um, I mean, what was it like before COVID and then through COVID? Like, did you learn any lessons there? Were you quite good at kind of cutting things off? And if you need to answer someone, feel No, good. sorry, it's just sort of bringing in some madness, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, so probably not. So we tend to do longer hours as uh, in me and my co sort of farmer director. Um, <laughs> Obviously, one of the issues we've had in the last few years, or one of the hardest things we've done, is trying to build ourselves out more of the day to day. The problem is that the more we stuck in dealing with those day to day bits, the less as a group or as a company we're moving forward. So the mm. less opportunity is for everybody, the less kind of we've progressed and gone and do bigger and better things. Mm. Um, so what we've kind of probably gravitated towards in the past is we stuck doing the day-to-day in the normal sort of office hours mm-hmm. and then probably pre-covid it was probably a half at seven most mm-hmm. nights so you get that kind of hour and a half two hour window where things have calmed down yeah the staff have kind of all gone home where we actually sit down and kind of do stuff to work on the business rather mm-hmm. than in it mm-hmm. um like i said we've had this we, we've always had this to-do list and this kind of list of things we want to deploy and improve within the company but it just always gets neglected by being stuck in a day-to-day kind of mode. Mm-hmm. So probably work life balance never been massively in favor of life versus mm-hmm. work. Mm-hmm. I think we became more aware of cutting back or developing that divide where we can do those working on the business things during the working day and not have to then stay so late or work weekends or whenever it be. Mm-hmm. And I think probably again, that's why I enjoyed COVID. One thing that I never realized until recently so was it last Christmas? I got COVID. I, I managed to avoid having it. 
mm. until I went to London mm. um, for a work event early December and it was when Bloody Omicron London. was coming out. <laughs> um, and I remember I, I came back with COVID mm. and I had 10 days of isolation because it was so close to Christmas. Mm. I lived with my girlfriend. I'd text as I was on my way home saying, look, I'm like, I feel bad. Um, I haven't been able to get any tests because of the short supply, but we had some at home. Mm. I'll come straight and I'll do a test in the other room. If it's positive, then obviously, because she was going to go spend the Christmas with her parents anyway mm. in the Midlands, I was like, just go kind of thing. There's no point us both having it. Mm. Um, and so I had 10 days right before Christmas, just by myself in the house. And mm. looking back, I genuinely like enjoyed it. I was... Um, <laughs> I was not doing any work. Like nobody expected anything of me. Like I had all the time to do whatever I wanted. Like obviously I was ill, so I wasn't partying yeah, or anything yeah. like that. But literally, I had no expectations. I had no deadlines. And nobody ringing me. Like literally mm. for ten days, mm. just it was like bliss. And mm. at the time, I never really realised. But since then, obviously, I've kind of looked back at it and realised there's probably a sign that work-life balance wasn't maybe right, and I was mm. more work and kind of rest mm. um and the reason i enjoyed it so much was because i felt just like i didn't have any time or any mm. any kind of deadlines to me which which was good so i think we've tried to promote a bit more since then mm -hmm. um so for example uh, one of the things we've done in our few months i don't have any notifications on my phone so i still i still do have mm. my email and teams but um unless i choose to look at it mm. it doesn't ping with any alerts, doesn't show any notifications on the screen, there's no mm -hmm. badges or anything that pop up. Mm -hmm. So again, when I'm not at work, if somebody emails me something through and before I might have seen it and thought, oh, there's a problem, I need to do something with it. Yeah, good. Now I don't even see it. <laughs> um, I've tried to stop doing stuff on weekends as well, like on an evening, yeah, so yeah. I'm more disciplined in what we do. So I'm at work. We don't leave as late as we used to do, as in mm -hmm. myself and Stuart, and we're trying to get a bit more of that back. And I think COVID showed us that so when we hit that low and we mm. were really quiet and we could work on the business we mm. literally could finish at five half five and i've mm. got through kind of meaningful actions mm. that we're going to deliver improvements to the business mm -hmm. so i think that kind of showed us right we really need to knuckle down and make this happen when we're in a kind of normal environment so we're not mm. stuck doing the day-to-day -day elements to give us this same work-life balance and to be honest it it didn't happen straight away we got sucked back into doing stuff when everything mm -hmm. started up and mm -hmm probably only in the last six months it's kind of um really taken sort of off um we've just hired in the last month month and a half sort of five weeks maybe six mm -hmm. weeks um our first like operations manager so mm -hmm. he's now able to do some of those bits that were keeping us <laughs> sorry there's a firearm test going off now <laughs> it's not a test <laughs> do they do not read it first day, so there we go yeah right. um <laughs> I'm, I'm instantly thinking hmm how do we how do we <laughs> logistically do this break and come back uh, but good right anyway sorry where were you <laughs> so yeah we had that law where we kind of we could see what it was actually like we could experience it we came yeah. back to kind of more normal environment. we got dragged back in a little bit yeah, yeah. and then we've recently hired our first kind of ops manager who's going to do some of those bits in the day-to-day -day now mm. along with some other bits that we kind of we've employed him to do so we can step back more so things mm. like obviously this podcast and stuff like that mm. taking a few hours out to do it probably two years ago mm. would have been problematic mm. whereas now we've got to a level where yeah i might need to go and do stuff throughout the day but it's not mm. like all hands on deck all the time kind of thing yeah, which yeah. i think i think has helped and i think covid's helped yeah. with that because it's helped illustrate benefits to it and that sort of stuff and i think mental health is something that um is a more talked about subject now mm -hmm. especially within probably the kind of male mm -hmm. arena um and i think i was aware of it in the past but probably not i was probably a bit ignorant to it i probably didn't know as much about it as i should have done that it's one of those things it. It, it, it's one of those things where you kind of you you know all the details but it's kind of like that's for other people sort yeah. of thing because yeah. it's like i I'm, I'm that's not really affecting me and then you go through something and it's like yeah. oh yeah that's for me as well <laughs> no definitely I should listen to these. <laughs> <laughs> i think like you say you 
your natural or my natural kind of stance is when stuff was getting hard to, to double down mm. when it should be like this is a this is a flag that mm. you can't continue down this path mm. but instead i'm like i'll double down and i'll get through it i'll double down and i'll get through it mm. and i think um covid's helped learn that sort of stuff and like i was saying about when i was isolated in 10 days at mm. the time or even weeks a few weeks after that or maybe even a month or two after that i couldn't necessarily say why i enjoyed it so much mm. but i've learned more about mental health this year over the last probably six seven months mm. um like i've actually tried to learn more about it to educate myself but mm. not only that but to help obviously the guys in the team to be able to spot stuff or mm. uh, to be able to give a balanced approach whereas before i probably couldn't mm. and it's that sort of learning that's helped me then relate back to mm. that time in isolation where i thought Do you know what this is someone was talking to me about this sort of stuff and Mm. questioning me on it I was like that's exactly why I loved it so much because it didn't have any of this burden of work anymore it was, mm. it was 10 days of no no expectation absolutely free mm. which again I've only learned that since learning more about mental health mm. and kind of the effects and the way that people deal with it and that kind of mm. stuff so yeah I think work-life balance is definitely important I think mm. remote working is probably a negative for that as well like mm. I personally like to be in the office. Um, I, I do value working at home, but I like to have a clear divide. Now yeah. between. Do you have an office at home? No, no. no. So it was just like the dining room table or something like that. So I like to have a, I'm completely finished. Like I'm away from my desk. It's a different environment. I've yeah. been out of the house. Yeah, um, aligned under it. That's yeah. done. I'm doing something else now. Yeah, definitely. And I think probably, um, that's something people got to be more aware of in the future. If people do go fully more, I think you have to do more around kind of like team culture and checking in. And mm. we use a tool actually called Office Vibe. Mm. And essentially what happens with that is you, you assign everybody up to it. It is completely anonymous from a staff perspective. So mm. they get asked random questions uh, once a week. It's like a quick email. They click a button, they write something in. They can do more if they want, but at bare minimum, they just click a button and they answer these random questions. And the idea is it gives us a kind of holistic view of where the team might be struggling, where mm. people might stress, like if there's low morale or if people are really happy. And it, it breaks it down into actionable areas. So like mm. feedback with me, for example, might be one. It might be job satisfaction. It might be work-life balance and the mental mm. health links into it. Um, and although I don't know who said what, where people individually are struggling, we do have a kind of platform for people to to ask. But mm. because it's anonymous, I can make those improvements and changes for everybody in the team. Mm -hmm. So if I know there is a problem somewhere, we'll do more to try and kind of help everyone or make it better for everyone in the aim that a person who doesn't want to be named mm. can benefit from it as well, which mm. again, three, four years ago, we probably wouldn't have thought about doing anything like that. Whereas now, we uh, we have to push it. Mm. Now that we've brexited, has that changed your work at all? Like, has it increased your work or decreased it? Has it made things better, worse, easier, harder, um, mm. or has there been no noticeable difference? I think in terms of where where UK based, mm. so in terms of direct effect, mm -hmm. um, it hasn't. We don't import, we don't export anything. The mm. things we do buy are licenses, software, so it hasn't mm. really changed those. Um, the only probably noticeable difference I'd say would be maybe the ability to send like devices, which we, we only do a small amount of time mm -hmm. abroad or buy stuff from abroad. 99% of the time, everything's UK based. So I don't mm -hmm. think it's had, from a business perspective, that much of an impact on us. Maybe through clients that maybe have been experiencing things, it could have mm -hmm. potentially, but again, in the in the industries we deal with, mm. um, the legal sector, financial, charities, that sort of stuff. Again, there's not a lot of kind of overseas import export. Mm. So I think probably it's been smaller or less noticeable for us than it might have been for other, especially I know like a few engineering firms and things like that, where they buy mm. materials from abroad, it'll have a bigger effect on them than it mm. would us. Um, so I don't think, or I don't feel anyway, that it's mm. had a, a massive noticeable change for us at all yeah yeah which is fair enough and like what I was saying was a lot of people because that happened as we were in the middle of 
you know various lockdowns and ongoing lockdowns a lot of people were like I, well I can't tell I don't know I don't yeah. know what awful thing is, is is being more awful to me um but yeah I haven't had anyone say like they've either not noticed or it's been awful um but I haven't had anyone say anything's been been good it's the best so far it's just like no I haven't noticed so we will go um, I'll get all the more grim questions out of the way first right. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do uh climate change next so this question did you hear that phone then i had a beep or a ping yeah <laughs> Sorry. Really? It, it did it before so it's, it's just one of those recordings um so yeah with climate change is there anything that you can do as a business or that you are doing um to either adapt to to mitigate or to raise awareness around climate change or is this something that's not really it's not really in your radar yet so it definitely is um again probably a few years ago wasn't something we really thought about um, mm. but we've definitely been more conscious of it over the last few years mm. in terms of being an it company there were there's like we don't own our own office, like we lease mm. an office. So there's, there's not tons that we can directly affect mm. kind of day to day. We do things like all our devices now go straight from supplier to client site. We don't have one necessarily sending them here to then go back mm -hmm. to clients. And they're only sort of minuscule. The one thing that we're doing and that's probably of note or will um, be a kind of genuine step in the right direction is we're going to become B Corp. I don't know if that's something mm. you've heard of. Mm. So um, we've we've kind of made a decision like six, seven months ago to try and go down this route. We've been learning about it and what we need to do because it is quite an evolved process. Mm. Um, we were at something, was it last week or the week before? We went to a B Corp meet and spoke to people about their application process and how it works. And I think mm. the consensus was it was about an 18-month application. and 18 or 18? 18, sorry, yeah. one eight. Um, so yeah, it, it, it takes that long to get accredited. So mm -hmm. we're obviously now we've got this ops manager and we've got a bit more time. It's something that we want to start the application process mm -hmm. in the next few months. It's probably going to be 2024 before mm -hmm. it comes to fruition if we're looking at an 18 month accreditation. But we want to do something more like that than because I know there's companies where you can plant trees, for example, to offset mm -hmm. you. But I don't know how um, beneficial that is. I don't know how it, it it's Not very kind of when they burn down, no. <laughs> well, um, and I think because it's got a lower barrier to entry, it's probably mm. less meaningful. Whereas B Corp is literally written into everything we do, it's fundamentally ingrained in mm. everything the business does. So I think it's probably more long lasting and kind of um, it gives greater effect to mm. sustainability and things like that. Mm. Um, but it, it is definitely a more involved process to become big cop. Mm. But I think um, the event we attended, there was only 15 big cop companies in mm. the entire room of people. So it's obviously more of a niche, like elite club at the minute. Yeah, it's. I, I don't think. I don't think it's that widely known. But, it, it, you know, again, it's one of those things of like you get this certificate, but it's not like, you know, I mean, it's kind of a voluntary thing at the end of the day. But then you, you kind of need that from a business perspective because you want the flexibility and the agility, especially as an IT company. Yeah. Um, let's just have a look at sort of this year with with the heat this year, like on the hot days. Were you working in the office? Were you working from home? Like, did you have any additional like problems that arose from that because you know like things like was service dropping was it affected were things overheating anything like that um we're mostly cloud based across the mm. client kind of um in terms of the solutions we deliver deliver so i mean they're all locked away in, in mm. server farms and things like that so mm. um they're all temperature controlled anyway we do have a few clients where they had on premise, like they have an on site server. So they might be hybrid and have an on site server. We have one or two maybe where we've had to have additional cooling for them, um, where they've not got proper kind of data room that can be temperature controlled. So we had a few issues in that. In terms of staffing, um, the the managed building we're in has actually got like air conditioning and things like that. That's kind of managed 
in the building. So our office is actually cool. I can't remember if we did have guys work from home. I think we were flexible with it. Um, but I think because of the air conditioning, mm. most people did come into the mm. office. I think one thing we did do, which was maybe a re- irrelevant to the question you've asked, but we um, we went and bought a load of ice creams, mm. <laughs> <laughs> drove them around to two free clients' offices and handed them out um, nice. as kind of a, a customer service <laughs> thing. Um, that was a bit difficult because I think we got to the second or third office and then yeah. literally a bag of ice creams was melted. Like, more like cream, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit that extreme heat. What I want to look at here, uh, obviously, you said you've you you know this is your first first podcast. Yes. Um. So, but and now you're you're into the region of creating content. So, what I'm looking at is how much time you have to spend on working on social media, or uh, but I've also kind of included you know sort of internal social media as well, things like Slack and and Teams and stuff for some people. But it's like the amount of time that you spend on it, does it return value for you? Do you see like actual benefit from the time that you give these things? Or is it just kind of like you feel like you have to do it and you have to put it out there and then hopefully it works? I think if just going over the internal stuff first, mm. we use Teams, obviously being a Microsoft partner. <laughs> we um, we push Teams. Um, we... We use it more when the guys are working remotely and mm-hmm. for some of the other systems. It's kind of just done like as and when it's needed rather than we spend a lot of time on it. So I think that kind of is just a necessary kind of amount of time that has to be put into it to kind of keep the, the systems and the guys running. In terms of then kind of, I guess, outreach or the social media we do as a company and the things like that, this is where we're at the kind of crossroads or the change. So in the past, essentially, we need to do it to have a presence. Mm. Um, it's more been a case of we just spend a minimal amount of time to to put the stuff out there. So if I go and meet someone or I see a prospect and they look us up online, which obviously they, they would do, they can see that we've posted weekly or monthly and it's not a case of we had donation for six years and then before that we were doing yeah. weekly. So that sort of stuff we do kind of, again, just as an out of necessity necessity in the past. Is it, is it you guys sort of as and when you don't have, do you have a social media marketer or a? a... Um, so we we have a company, like an industry company where yeah. we, um, they're a marketing company, but they yeah. tailor just for MSPs. So yeah. they provide us a lot of content and then we then right. kind of regurgitate it or we can send it out. Mm-hmm. We do top it up with some stuff that we do ourselves, mm-hmm. but especially for things like Twitter, where mm-hmm. it's probably going to be a low value for us in terms of return on investment, mm. it's more a case that we just kind of put out pre, um, pre-automated pre tweets on kind of the stuff throughout the month. Um, blogs and guides, take a, we do a bit more with, um, and then emails again to clients or prospects. Uh, at the minute, I do that. We have just started working with another company who are doing some more content marketing for us, but that we're only two months in with that, if that. Um, so we kind of can't really good success on that at the minute. Mm. But essentially in line with what we learned in COVID and being able to work on the business rather than in it, my role is becoming more sales and marketing, hence mm. been on this podcast. Mm. Um, yeah, in terms of it, we, we want to transition from just putting stuff out there just to tick a box, mm. but now to put stuff out there to be like either seen as a thought leader or to actually add in value to people um so we're doing videos we're about to start some more youtube stuff i did funny enough do some under lockdown so again when i had this extra time i did start doing like a monthly video where i talked about just a random subject obviously we got dragged back into stuff when the office reopened and then i'm not revisited. on your phone or were you shooting stuff like did no not on my phone so yeah. yeah just had kind of the backdrop of the office yeah um and i just talk about either like the monthly guide or i remember i can't remember that was it house part of the app there was a there was an app that went crazy in lockdown uh, everybody used yeah <laughs> and then a story came out about it is it secure is it insecure no, and my I first actual that. video was all about that and yeah. about how it works and whether or not it was secure yeah. so just stuff <laughs> like that really where I'm not trying to sell, but I'm trying to educate people on mm. some of the bits that we do or some of the mm. bits we can we can share in, insight into. So 
that stopped um and yeah that's kind of about to start again in the next mm. sort of two three months mm. um so i kind of my job will be becoming more of that face of everyone i guess so mm. um potentially doing some public speaking which mm. i'm utterly terrible at but i'll have to learn to get better <laughs> um podcast if yeah. i can obviously add value to people's podcasts more than mm. happy to do it Mm-hmm. own internal youtube videos and then linkedin doing more on linkedin and, mm-hmm. and webinars showing people how to do stuff so mm-hmm. again the the everyone culture uh, we call it the everyone way um we want to be 100 percent transparent in what we do mm-hmm. so there's no black art or magic to anything we do mm-hmm. so if you as a client or a prospect want to learn how to do something mm-hmm. you should be able to see how we do it from the youtube from a webinar one of the systems. In reality, everybody will still go on and do it once they've learned how to do it, but only a small percentage of people do. Mm. So I guess kind of our idea is that we'll pull this out there, people will either try it or understand how to do it, but then they'll just default to us mm. to do it anyways. It's mm. kind of where we want to go. Obviously, we're literally less than two months into that kind of transition. Mm. So I couldn't tell you how successful it has been or how successful it might be right now. Mm. Um, and I think the the plan is that it's more long-term. So it mm. might benefit us directly for a year or even two years. Mm. But ultimately, if we're chipping away at all these little things, that we will eventually kind of get a return on investment. And it'll be, because it's taken us longer to build an audience and the mm. audience will be built into what we're actually about and what we actually do. Um, it'll be more beneficial and give us more reward in the long term so you looking at all the metrics now then have you ended up with like here are our facebook likes and posts and reach and and everything so not really at the minute i mean Mm. so we've worked with we've done quite a few different things in the past Mm. so we, we have tried to to do lots of different things so we've done like um facebook ads google ads linkedin ads we've done like other kind of outreach and other bits i think the problem is that we've always worked with other companies to do it and mm. stats can be great but stats can also be terrible because they can be not bent a such term mm. but you can prioritize a stat a bit like our help desk system having meaningful mm. stats for clients you could push a stat which for example like reaches mm. i could get a thousand people liking a post but mm. if none of those thousand people live in england mm. In reality, that metric means nothing to me because they're not going to ever need one. I'm sorry, they're not going to ever be a potential customer. Mm. So, um, true, but they out, could know someone in England who could be a potential customer. Potentially, potentially, yeah. but then I, everything's potential, isn't it? <laughs> no, they are. But having somebody that's funded, having somebody that it gets on a Zoom call with me, or having somebody mm. starting a meeting is a more mm. meaningful metric to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Than having like a massive reach or a million likes because yeah. I, I don't get me wrong they do they do lend themselves to that ultimate goal of mm. new prospects and new customers signing up but i think they should be classed as secondary metrics mm. and the primary should always be the deliverables of how many people are speaking to how many prospects are actually like filling in a form on the website how many mm. people have downloaded the guide from the webinar how many mm. people have attended the webinar would be mm. more meaningful than the kind of initial reach and I, we've been not misled because that's probably the wrong, wrong word but we've 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 employed companies in the past to go out and do stuff for us mm. and they've then just presented wow well, you've, you've had this much reach you've had this mm. much and yeah. not All one person's done, done anything meaningful numbers, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And numbers again, went just, up. <laughs> yeah but the the actual return on investment yeah. still not changed yeah but i am just wary when I speak to marketing or digital agencies and I'm sure there'll be people that might listen to this and <laughs> think I'm wrong. But um, that just focus on those metrics, those secondary mm. metrics. I think it's easy to boost them if they need to be boosted without mm. delivering a quantifiable like return on the kind of flip side of it. Mm. We've got, I guess, kind of easy things that I can do now. So I can go out and I can, I went to a charity dinner that was invited to live a week. I met two, three people there. Got mm-hmm. a meeting with someone next week on that. Mm-hmm. That's something I can do here and now. I can be on this podcast, which is going to be more of a longer term thing. Mm-hmm. Someone might never listen to this that ever wants IT. Mm-hmm. Or no one might ever listen to this. Mm-hmm. But I'm learning and I'm hopefully getting better and better at public speaking, for example. Exactly. You get immediate 
training essentially yeah. from from practice yeah so I think I've kind of got a split approach where I've got stuff I can directly go and do now more mm-hmm. networking events I can go and speak to people I can if I really need to just go and knock on doors and things like that mm-hmm. is my kind of short term fill in the funnel I think my longer term stuff is I'm doing these videos which I'm sure will be terrible and I might be super awkward but a year down the line it might actually look yeah average <laughs> and two years down the line it might actually look really good so I think I just need to approach it in those two different areas yeah. stuff that I can do right now where I can generate direct ROI yeah. versus the longer term bits, which if I get an offer for six months or a year out of, mm-hmm. but I'm improving and I'm growing kind of these different aspects, mm. that's my return initially there. And then if I'm doing it for two, three, four years and getting nowhere, then someone needs to tell me to stop. But yeah. <laughs> hopefully um, we don't get that far. Mm-hmm. And as well, like the tendency with, you know, when you, when you're good at posting, like I, I see a lot of people who are really good with their posts. Yeah. And, and but the thing is you end up, you end up, the posts end up becoming about the posts rather than about anything else, because that's what a good post is. It's like, this post's really amazing. <laughs> and it's just telling you about that post. Like you even see posts telling you how to make a great post like this. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And then it's kind of like, <laughs> what is it about outside of that it's just yeah. posting about posting so yeah one of the things that i say a lot of now is uh, obviously personal branding and mm. that's a whole industry now isn't it like creating personal branding and mm. kind of growing your own personal audience <laughs> what i see on linkedin is i see exactly like you said i see a post mm. about something that has zero to do with what that person does or what their skill set mm. is but just to capture attention, I see again mm-hmm. tons of likes, tons of views. And then within a week, I see the virtually the same post mm-hmm. on somebody else's LinkedIn. I might see two, three, four times. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, these posts are just put out there to deliver engagement and these comments or these mm-hmm. likes. It, they're not delivering any added value mm-hmm. to me about that person's specific skill set. So mm-hmm. if they're a cybersecurity professional, for example, and they can mm-hmm. tell me how to increase my cybersecurity, Mm. the post I get some more engagement is something completely irrelevant <laughs> and then people just pop up all the time mm. so uh, I think you've just got to be careful to um, I want to always add value I want to always deliver something that somebody can take something away from re- relating to IT mm. I don't necessarily want to be um, getting 100 million likes for something completely irrelevant like yeah for doing yeah. floss or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the amount of stories you see about, and th- this one really <laughs> grates me, to be fair, is where people do something nice, which is great, but they feel the need to put on LinkedIn to get yeah. likes and engagements. And I just think, because that's ultimately your goal. You're not doing it for free, because you're doing it to buy your engagement or to buy likes <laughs> in an audience. But even though you might not pay for it, you, mm. ultimately you've got a, a reason that I, that I can't stand. Do something, by all means, do mm. stuff for people. Mm. I don't feel the need to put on LinkedIn it all mm. literally makes me cringe around it mm. but it's the same sort of thing you'll see someone do it and then you see it replicated throughout my network and I just think mm. I, I, if I ever get to that point I've lost sight of my values I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay so I'm gonna go on to the change question now so this is like um basically you have carte blanche here you can um so the question is you could change any three things about your work right now what would they be uh so they can be from nothing at all to you know like everything's perfect to changing the world or you know like no budget we can we can time travel if you want whatever you want to do like what what would you change if you could change any three things the my work and industry are just literally my work. uh however you want to interpret it generally with your role but i mean you can go industry wide as well if you want all right so i mean i guess we, i've kind of alluded to one of the the first things which would be not to be to be doing the day-to-day and to be focusing on those kind of things that are going to add value to us as a company mm-hmm. rather than to fix a printer or to, to reset yeah. password i think that that would be the biggest one and even though we're making steps towards it, there's still things that uh, I'm needed for. I, I kind of help with where in an ideal world, I'd want to literally just be focusing on the kind of growth of the business rather than being stuck in it would be the first one. Um, you said three, didn't you, I think? Yeah. I think in terms of 
our industry and time travel and stuff, we're probably in a good good space. Um, I don't think I'd want to be 100 years earlier. <laughs> no. I'd be well ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, so don't think about that. I think probably people being being better with people and I don't think I'm necessarily bad with people, but I think a trait of IT people is we're more technical than sociable or personable. Mm. I think it's something I have to work harder at than probably non-technical people. Mm. Um, so I think things that would all lend itself to like the mental health stuff that I've learned recently, mm. like all the bits we can do for our culture mm. is I've had to, to work hard to learn those things. And mm. I think if I, if I could change and all of a sudden like, it'd be more natural for me growing up and I, we'd, we'd be further ahead because I'd be able to, we'd have a, a better culture, even though the culture's mm. good, we'd have stronger ties. Mm. I think I'd already be aware of the mental health sort of stuff and we'd be doing more around it. Climate control, giving back. We haven't really talked about um, kind of the stuff to give back to the community that we want to do or we're starting to do. Um, but I'd have done those things earlier. Um, so I'd definitely that personally for me. And then I, I don't know necessarily about the company as such. I think, again, maybe a third one for me or third one that pops ahead is, so yeah, early on, I was quite clear about what I wanted to do. It was in other business, next Y, and Z. I think I got comfortable. So don't get me wrong, I wouldn't change. Like, I don't regret what I've done or mm -hmm. how we got here. Mm -hmm. But I think I could have done it sooner. I think I could have knocked five years off where mm -hmm. I am by uh, being more goal-oriented initially or sticking to my goal. I think part of the issue was, this seems like I'm getting really deep now, when we talked about my friends going to university and stuff like that, mm. I never really felt I missed out on that because I could go live some of the student life by visiting them and I had mm. money to go on nights out with them and mm. things like that. Mm. Um, I think when I got to that point, I got comfortable in that lifestyle mm. because the people that I spent most time with mm. couldn't necessarily afford to do the things I could do, not because I was earning well or anything like that, but just because I had a salary in other students. Yeah, and they just but, come out of university, so they have to bum around for a year before it Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I think... I got comfortable in that um, for longer than I needed to get. I think I was comfortable, I was happy, I enjoyed everything I was doing. And that initial goal was less important to me because I was just happy with what I was doing. Mm. But I wasn't, I think I plateaued and then I was just, just sort of relaxed into it, basically. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But then I think there's things I know now, I could literally have, for five years, I've probably had that point where I didn't really do much I could go back and but there was no incentive for you at that point there was no you know like other than make money and you were kind of making enough money at the time I mean like you know I suppose if perhaps I mean I don't know your marital status or whatever but perhaps if you've had like a you know got married and had a kid at that sort of point you would have been like, right, I need to earn more I yeah. need to be doing more so I think some of that's incentive as well and I I would I believe that those years are going to like they'll be invaluable to you later like you'll have learned a lot of stuff you've got that experience of being on the front line like and so long as you keep that in mind because you were yeah. there for a long time like you can keep relating to that I think it's going to be valuable for you in the future no I, I'd like to say I, I definitely do not regret them yeah um, but I just think I could be five years further ahead if yeah I had, of course but... for a little bit you know, you, you can always be richer and more successful and more yeah, productive. Yeah. I, I, you could always have done more today, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you could have always sat down more as well and chilled out more. And No, and that's one of the things I've definitely learned since COVID. So, yeah. Cool. Right, uh, are we happy with finishing that question there? I think you've successfully answered that. That's, that's yeah, great. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, da, 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 da change run okay so let's go ubi so uh this will be interesting following on from what you've just said so uh if there was a universal basic income so basically if you were essentially like having furlough but like if you were given an amount each month it's like hey you're part of society have some money to take part in it um to provide your basic needs um you can include universal basic services in it if you want to 
or you can say it's all a bunch of filthy socialist nonsense or like <laughs> but if there was a, if there was a UBI how do you think that would change things for you like if you were given enough to live on would you have the drive would you still be wanting the Ferrari and you still be wanting to do the hours is basically the crux of the question um or would you be doing something else like would you be doing what you're doing now would you do it the same um or would you be doing something else so I think I would yeah. I think I'd still still I think you'd definitely be doing something yeah um so obviously the, the Ferrari thing was me being naive when I was younger and mm -hmm. thinking that was you've made it a success blah 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 what I obviously know now is that it's just a material thing it, it, it's a nice to have don't get me wrong I, if someone gave me one I'd live it but um yeah. it's not going to change my outcome of my life Mm -hmm. um, whereas something more meaningful like getting time back for example being able to retire earlier which is actually now the goal I'm working towards mm -hmm. is something more meaningful that I can spend more time with people or kids or whatever mm -hmm. I need to do so that's what I'm working to so I think regardless of whether there was a UBI or not I'd want to still achieve that goal knowing what I know now and who I am mm -hmm. today so that would still drive me forwards I think obviously at the minute what I think is everybody's dealt a different set of hand, like different set of cards mm. and 100% is people that uh, need more help than others or people that are born into kind of um, easier lives than others. Um, I think nowadays in the country we live in and the society we live in, there should be anybody who's in poverty. So I think there should definitely be something where everybody gets kind of that base level. Mm. And then from there, I think, everybody's got the opportunity now with the internet and I'm not saying it's the same path for everybody or it's the same difficulty because it's completely not mm -hmm. I think with um like the internet and being able to to speak to people like this is the kind of thought process that I have when I've chatted about this sort of stuff in the past mm -hmm. if I was born 50 years ago I'd have to know somebody to be able, I'd have to physically be able to touch that person mm. for them to help inspire or educate me about what I needed to do to change that life circumstance. Mm -hmm. Whereas now with the internet and YouTube, although it does come with its own negatives and that there's so much out there of living the Instagram life and all this other mm. kind of nonsense. Mind culture. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if you, if you can filter that out, there's genuine learnings that you can get from mm. people which you never physically have to touch or know that person they don't even have to be here they can be anywhere else in the world and i think you genuinely have the ability now to go out and learn something that um is not limitless but do you know what i mean that you don't physically have to mix in that circle to learn some of these lessons now and i think mm. you can use some of those things and some of them like people will fail at some of them mm. people will have massive success I think everybody's got the ability, as long as you've got the internet now, to go out and learn these things. And I don't even think you have to be academic. Obviously, I not got good grades. I genuinely think there's that much resource available and it's never been as accessible as it is now. Mm. That people have more power to change mm. their outcomes than ever before. Mm. I do, like I say, though, genuinely believe that there is a massive disadvantage in some people's upbringings and they'll kind of places people live or mm. the, the economic status which if we can flatten those out as much mm. as possible with things like UBI is a massive benefit for everyone mm. but I yeah I don't I don't think you won't get to a point where I think communism was sort of is too far the other way isn't it it's an extreme where you're you're ruining people's creative for ambitions because you kind of just send everybody in a system where you'll only ever be a number rather than to, to go on and do what you want to do so I think there is a balance for both. I, I do think we need to do a lot more with kind of help for mm. people that really need it at the minute. And one of the charities we actually work with or started working with in the last 12, 18 months is Simon on the Streets mm. for the homeless kind mm. of in Leeds, which I know is a bigger problem than ever. Mm. And then especially with the cost of living crisis is going to become a bigger problem and stuff. Mm. So I don't think there's enough done for people like that and, mm. and getting people kind of to a, a livable status or a, and, and like getting them off the breadline kind of thing getting to mm. something where they've got the freedom and choice to go on and do different things mm. we definitely need to do more for i think mm. yeah i wanted to go to the big sleep out but i'm a filthy coward so i didn't um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna I go one year. Too, yeah yeah i will i will go one year 
yeah, I think Salmon on the Streets are really good. Um, there's there's some really good homeless organisations in Leeds. Um, yeah. I want to get I want to get you on the podcast, homeless organisations. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that that that's a, a, a good answer. Uh, and I like what you say there about sort of having you know you you need a you need a mix of approaches. It's like these things you can think of them like a, a palette you know like an artist's palette or you can think of them like a toolbox you, you know you don't just use the hammer or the saw you know you use the right tools for the right circumstances and and the job um so that that would be my approach but then you know I'm not a lunatic who's in charge so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, any of the guys are in charge. Of it, well, no, I mean, it puts truth to the lie, doesn't it? It's, it's like Terence McKenna says, the truth is nobody's in charge. And that's the really <laughs> scary thing. OK, so I'm going to throw it over to you. So uh, uh, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to kind of discuss, bring up? Or if there's anything that you want to kind of highlight or, you know, you want to do a big business pitch or sort of like if anybody's listening to this, who knows anybody who wants this, then yeah, over to you to say what you want, really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any necessarily questions or anything like that. Obviously, I'm not going to miss the opportunity to deliver a sales pitch <laughs> or attempt it. So for people that are listening, obviously, we're Evron. We're an active company based in Leeds, and we specialize in Microsoft 365 and cloud for regulated industries. So that's uh, legal sector, financial, like insurance, accountants, charities. Again, we work with a few different charities. And we essentially will do the mundane, keep the lights on IT. So fixing print problems, um, reset passwords, setting new desk, users up. Um, but our kind of USP is more along value add and turning IT from a cost to a benefit. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is through continual improvement, which is one of our everyone values. And ultimately, we get to learn new business, new process, new people. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have quarterly reviews where we'll kind of marry up some of your pain points or inefficiencies with technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and our aim is to deliver more usable time for you and your staff, mm -hmm. um, allowing you to obviously generate more return on investment by utilizing people better, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, as a rule of thumb, we like to think that anything, a any repetitive task that a person is doing, mm -hmm. we can teach computer to do. Mm -hmm. So then you can redeploy that staff member to an area that is profit making rather mm -hmm. than kind of just, again, admin related. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we do that. Obviously, website is everon.co.uk, E-V-E-R-N.co.uk, if anybody's interested. Cool. And then, yeah, again, if anybody does have a podcast that they'd like me to be on, I'm more than happy to, to attempt to help you out there as well, build my exposure. Yeah. Hopefully a more businessy one that, that gets you to, lets you, lets you pitch more. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I go that, all over the place with this nonsense. <laughs> no, I, I'm happy to just to get, to get exposure and talk about anything. I mean, yeah. um, it doesn't have to be a sales pitch all the time. It's it's people, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. where people buy from people. And I think yeah. getting to know somebody, this is as good as way as any. If somebody listens to this, they'd hopefully understand mm. a little bit about me and my values and mm. they could decide whether we were right fit as a company or not based on that. So I think it is still worthwhile. Mm. I mean, you know, and then don't forget, you know, there's the inspiration factor as well. You know, like think about the stuff that you stumbled across when you were younger and like, you know, think about those first sort of, business podcasts and things that you got into like the first kind of you know the influencers for you that you kind of like you know they drive you on to doing new things or open up new possibilities for you and that that's the thing you know with like I think it's our imagination is too limited at the moment and we need we need people to come up with new ways of like new spaces and new ways of imagining things yeah um I want to like based on what you said then I'd, I'd just uh ask you quickly about kind of the future and automation because you mentioned like you know automation of kind of menial tasks and so on and I know that training is like a big part of your offer as well you know like you're offering training to businesses yeah. um so I I mean it, it's quite a in terms of uh, value-led and thinking about the future I mean like are you is your mission kind of because it does sound like you've got a bit of a mission. Like, is it upskill everyone and automate all boring stuff? Is that, is that kind of <laughs> yeah? Ultimately, where you go? yeah. Um, if you were 
in an ideal world, anything that a computer could do on a repetitive task, you'd generate a computer to do it and you'd deploy that person, you'd improve their kind of skill set and you'd you'd do the bits that computers can't do or can't do as well as humans in an ideal world. I think that's where we see everything going. The big thing with obviously we're a Microsoft partner and we we, we use a 365 cloud, but people probably only use 10, 20% of what the cloud does. And Microsoft mm-hmm. actually continuously deliver new apps and mm-hmm. features to 365. Mm-hmm. Um, but just nobody knows about them. And I think one thing that we try to do, or one thing that I see a lot that is is quite frustrating is that people just get either such bad advice or they mm-hmm. they don't know what they don't know. So mm-hmm. they're, they're stuck using this little bit, but then they've got all this capacity that's not used. Mm-hmm. And there was a start and I, I learned this was it two weeks ago microsoft put a billion dollars into r d mm. of their new product offerings and 365 and what it can do so if you were to look at all the other vendors similar to microsoft and their option offerings they give those combined don't spend a billion dollars on r d mm. so microsoft in one company outspends the majority of the industry mm. so i think if you look at that and the way they're going with things that um, it's only ever going to get more and more powerful and people that are stuck doing jobs that can be replaced in the future. I'm not saying mm. they should be replaced, mm. but should be aware of it and try and learn something new or kind of find an angle where they're not going to mm. kind of be going against the kind of industry and the way the technology is progressing, mm. I'd say. I'm keeping an eye on the time here. I don't want to, I don't want to take us over, um, but, I want to kind of explore that a little bit. What are your thoughts on it? So do you remember that story? I think it was during lockdown that there was like a leak. There was a it was a data breach, I think, somewhere in the NHS. And it was like they'd lost this spreadsheet. And then it was like, why are they using a spreadsheet? And I was like, obviously, none of these fucking journalists have ever worked in, this, yeah. <laughs> in, in any company <laughs> in this country. Um because, you know, like there's so much of like pulling information out of systems and putting them in other systems and pulling information out of secure systems because you can't work them in there because it's too old and it hasn't been updated or all of these kind of things where people are doing circumvents and workarounds and using yeah. like naff old stuff because they don't have the skills or the management doesn't have the knowledge or like there is so much in terms of upskilling that this yeah. country and this is. And this is one of the most advanced countries in the world still, you know, yeah. like one of the highest educated still. OK, that's, you know, rapidly falling down the chart. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, still, we're, you know, this is this is kind of incredible that there's this like huge knowledge and information gap and, and user ability gap. Like, I just want to get your thoughts on it, basically. The amount of clients that will have be really cyber security conscious which mm. is the perfect way to be but they'll be like right we want to lock this this and this down and then like you just said they completely neglect the, the staff training mm, element yeah, people have to use it <laughs> yeah um there's gonna forever be this war or this um the more secure something is the less it lends itself to kind of being real world usable if you lock something down so it's the most secure system in the world mm. And then you want kind of your, your staff to use it. They're going to encounter mm-hmm. business case productivity problems because they're going to have to jump through extra hoops. Mm-hmm. So there's always going to be a trade-off between locking something down and being usable in a business mm-hmm. sense. So I think you've got to be, you first of all, you've got to educate yourself on the risk mm-hmm. because it's it, that's something we, we try and do here. Is it's all right to say you should do X, Y, and Z. If you don't understand why and you don't value why you're doing it, you're not going to stick to doing it. And a bit like you mentioned, there's so many stories where the management or the people high up in these organizations don't understand and they stop doing stuff. Mm. If you're not going to do it, how are the people underneath you? How is the kind of whole team going to do it when you don't adopt it yourself? So I think you have to really understand the reasons for doing it and understand the value in it initially. And that's why we try and do a whole training section around it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think then you probably find that securing the systems and the technology is the easier part of the two. I think the harder bit is that team culture of doing X, Y, and Z in the right way and following process. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, 
it's not you could secure something but if you haven't got the process for people to follow and you haven't spent the time educating on why it's important mm. you might as well not do the the kind of first part of it mm. um in a sense sometimes so it's harder in big organizations and i think public sector really struggle with it because there's so many variables there's so many different departments that are mm. all in tune and the that, rules change every week <laughs> yeah i think it's it's really hard and even in larger organizations it's really hard because if you want to deliver a new technology or a new process and you've mm. got 15 people you could sit them in one room if mm. you're a, a kind of multinational office like company sorry with offices all around the world or all around the country how do you how do you get everybody to buy into that kind of mm. same way of thinking and that same process mm-hmm. obviously being a tech company we love process so we've mm. got a whole documentation system which is just process after process after process mm. but i do know that that's probably unnatural for most companies especially the more creative you are the less rules you want in place i guess the harder it is to mm. to follow process mm-hmm. but um if you look at the biggest risk security wise to companies it comes from people and it's not necessarily people doing anything malicious people that just don't understand or or make a mistake which is is really easy to do and forever that's going to be the case because it's cat and mouse isn't it it's mm. the then system comes out somebody finds a way of securing it the hackers or whoever it is then find a new way around it and i think we're getting to the point where the easiest way for people in now is to target people so they'll send an email saying i'm this person and like for example we get a lot because we deal with the legal industry a big risk for them is in conveyancing where the people that are buying these houses have to send the money into the solicitors what happens is we have um people that will just sit lurking in email systems so, for example, the buyer will have their email hacked. Somebody will just sit in there and be watching the emails come back and forth. They're mm-hmm. not going to do anything malicious. The minute the solicitor says, right, your house is completing, send the funds to here, mm-hmm. that person just sat in that mailbox, all of a sudden changes the bank uh, security sort code and account number, sorry. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, what looks like a genuine communication is now being tampered mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. That person, that buyer in good faith, sends the money to what's in the email. And it goes completely into someone else's bank account. Mm. And I think that's a much easier route for people to be hacked or for hackers to take now than it is to hack that yeah. uh, client system or hack that yeah. bank feed or yeah. account system, whatever it might be. Yeah. And I think people are less aware of it than they, they should be. I think all these companies that sell this cybersecurity software and stuff sell it and people think, I just buy it and that's enough. Yeah, uh, it is a whole culture now that people yeah. have to be aware of, and again, it has to start top down. If you're not pre, if you're not practicing what you pre- preach as a manager or owner, how can you expect people who work for you to do the same thing? So yeah, that's my question. I'll I'll do one quick last one. Right. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you about recruitment because I thought about it earlier in the conversation and just sort of, you know, how you got into the job. And, and you finding people, if you could have recruitment any way you wanted it, like, or, or just any thoughts, like, you know, is it, is it, because I think the recruitment process itself is knackered. It's not fit for purpose anymore. I don't think, like, I think this whole, you know, people train people to write CVs and like most jobs are kind of application forms generally. Yeah. But then even then, the better jobs people are going directly and like no one's no one really teaches people about spec letters or things like that anymore uh, but then obviously you've got to have there's issues like diversity there you've got to like you know you're not just hiring your mates and like people who have got the skills can come into the industry all of that kind of stuff so just quickly your thoughts on recruitment um so just on and diversity was in the last thing you mentioned mm. we struggle with it Mm. I think because it's quite a male dominated environment mm. is tech not well IT support mm. especially is quite male dominated and I think I probably could count on one hand the amount of female applicants mm. we've ever had obviously if there's a way that we can help with that we'd try and do it but even the apprentices apprenticeships we've had again I don't think I've ever had a single applicant yeah, been really female gendered, yeah yeah um, so I think that's a big problem for our industry as a whole mm. and Oh, maybe that's more because it's not glamorous and mm. 
people choose to go into more creative roles instead, like web agencies and things like that. Um, but that's probably something that needs fixing at a kind of lower level or like a college level to try and really showcase what people can do and how people uh, can progress with kind of some of the newer technologies. In terms of our recruitment in an ideal world, we'd always want to kind of have people grow with us. Mm. Um, so I take people from apprenticeships. Like I say, we're going to look at graduate schemes next year mm. and take people and then kind of take them on this journey with us where they can embed in their culture straight mm. away. We're not taking people that come from a completely different culture and then trying to impress on something that's alien to them. Mm -hmm. um, would be an ideal for me. We have used recruitment in uh, recruiters in the past, mm -hmm. but we've not had masses of success with it. And I think for the reasons that you outlined, that it's a whole industry is recruitment now. Mm -hmm. You writing a CV is probably a very inaccurate reflection as wow. you as we move forward. As me reading a few okay, four or two sheets, or even really sitting down with you for half an hour in a face-to-face -face interview, I think doesn't give a good um don't give a rounded yeah, yeah yeah of of how you progress because it's easy to be on your kind of best behavior or mm -hmm. the mold to what you think that mm -hmm. you need to be mm -hmm. we try and approach it from the fact that when we do we have two or three contacts with someone before we we sit down with them but when we sit down with them so the minute we we face to face mm -hmm. we approach it from the perspective that it's us on interview for them as much mm -hmm. as it is us mm -hmm. to them. So for example, we do the kind of more formal interview bit, but then we let them meet the team in the office mm -hmm. and me and the other director, we disappear and we literally just give them time alone with the team so they can ask any questions. Mm -hmm. They can see live work that's happening. They can mm -hmm. ask about the culture and the people. Um, because I think there is also the flip side of companies promise X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. especially in a competitive mar market. And then they don't deliver that for people. Um, mm -hmm. So as much as I say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, I think it means more a new recruit hearing it from the team than it does me saying it because the team live it, then you know exactly what it's like. Yeah, yeah. When you're, of uh, course, you're going to say it. You're the boss. So you're trying to say yeah, exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. Like, Come work for me. It's great. It's like, yeah. is it though? <laughs> so I think um, that's mega important for us. And I, like I said, I think our ideal is we we want to take people and Grow, grow them and mm -hmm. there isn't really a feeling for where we want to go because we'll be pretty flexible with people's past as long mm -hmm. as they're in line with what we're, we're offering to clients we're always trying to accommodate it and yeah I think the hardest thing for us is when we're a smaller team culture is really hard to develop and easy to lose mm -hmm. so if you get one person that is really negative um, in a kind of your organisation it's really mm -hmm. hard for them to like wipe away some of that good culture and it takes a lot longer to build it than it does to um, to have it lost. Mm. Whereas I think if you were 50 people and you had a really good culture mm. and you had that one person that necessarily was like not a good fit or didn't see the values that the, the organization shared, yeah. I think they would naturally, like the peer system of in that culture would naturally kind of out them and everybody would be aware of it. Whereas the minute one person can easily destroy it. 10 person great culture mm. whereas it's a lot harder for one person to destroy a 50 user great culture i think mm. is one of the challenges we also have yeah um, but then uh, that kind of for me that kind of links back to the whole thing of what you were saying in terms of the you know mental health and well-being kind of agenda yeah. of like well can we can we intercept and actually do anything for yeah. this person to improve things overall but then all of these things are time and money as well so they're all costs and expenses and it's not easy is it <laughs> no no and i don't think there's a, a right approach like there's no one there's no magic word for this i don't think is that i think no yeah a bit of one of the things that i say a lot the minute is practice what you preach mm. so if we say something we've got to deliver it because if we don't then your values don't mean anything because you're never going to follow them through so mm. even silly things like when we're busy if somebody books like one of the team book an appointment out of my calendar mm. um although it's hard sometimes when you've got loads of stuff going on to mm. stick to being on time mm. literally i've got it because I'm, I'm there to help them with things they need so if, if they put something in and i say yeah put in my calendar to not turn up in it is just is worse than not booking it in the first place mm. so once it's there um it's a case of practicing what you preach isn't it and mm -hmm. kind of doing the things that they need when i say i'm going to do them and stuff so yeah 
Mm. It's easy to say, like you say, and that, that's why I, I think it, it's more meaningful when it comes from the team to somebody else rather than me saying it. Just like you say, I'm always going to say it, mm. X, Y, and Z. Thank you again to Jamie for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you, my dear listener. Pay me money, pay me money, pay me money, 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 money. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released, to DM me with your questions, or most importantly, to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Please do chuck in anything you can to help the show grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for a pound a month or you can make a one-off donation of whatever amount. Uh, you can also go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours, again, from as little as a pound a month. Why not be super awesome and join both? Do something new and something different. Remember to like, share, follow, and subscribe to Working Hours. That's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, leads. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited, and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Please like Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds. And on LinkedIn linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Leads, are you considering taking the plunge into podcasts or audio content? Then think Western Studios for support, advice and guidance on getting it made. At Western Studios, you work with a real life learner who is actually in Leeds. Not a piece of software, not a course of articles or a series of live chats and video courses, but me, a person in physical place-based reality. If you want to work with me to make your podcast or any digital audio content in Leeds, whether it's for your own cause, your publicity campaigns, to promote your products, increase your sales, or just to create your own passion projects, then get in touch with me, Western Studios, now. Don't wade through vapid articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts by disembodied virtual people on the web. Get on with making your podcast now, and then when it gets hard and expensive and it all goes wrong, which it will, then call Western Studios to make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios will take on your podcast boring, time-consuming and painful admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about your podcasting pain points and I can make it all better for you. I feel your pain. For a charge, I will share it. Remember, podcast work is work. Leeds businesses, Leeds campaigns, Leeds brands. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start? Contact Western Studios at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast straight away. The first hour of arranged consultation and pre-production time is free. £25 an hour after that for editing, recording, production. I can also arrange hefty discounts for the right projects. So tell me your idea and your budget and I'll tell you what I can do for you. What do you have to lose? Time, that's what. Time is running out. The best time to make a podcast was 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. Writers in Yorkshire, what are you doing with your lives? Hopefully you're writing. Well, I know there are listeners out there who want to hear great original writing performed as audio content that is about and for and has been made in Leeds. How do I know this? Because I'm one of them loiners what wants it. Help me make your old screenplays, unpublished novels, unperformed plays, stories, poems and performances, whatever you got baby, and make it as podcast content. Is your work arty, salacious, pulpy, strange? Good. Is it unfinished? Good. I can help you with that too. I can work with you to find actors, musicians and voiceover artists and quickly realise your projects. I get practice making the shows and you get a finished, performed and published version of your writing. Save yourself the hassle and the headache of making your podcasts on your own by working with me instead.